Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Spencer Lodge podcast in partnership with Najahi Events and the incredible author Mustafa. I can't thank her enough for being the sponsor of this podcast. They bring such talented people here to the UAE, and I get to interview them too. So that's a double whammy for me. Okay, on today's episode of the podcast, I interviewed an awesome guy. His name is John Sane. Now, John is a futurist from the Singularity University from South Africa, just moved to Dubai, and by golly, by gosh, did this guy impress me. He really impressed me. An author of three best-selling books and he has a really good grasp on what the future is, what's going to happen, how it's going to happen and how it will impact upon our lives. I'm telling you everything already. I shouldn't. Cue the music. Enjoy. So, John, thank you very much for coming to the studio on the Spencer Lodge podcast. Is it your first time here in, uh, in Dubai? No, no, I've been many times, but first time here as a resident. I'm living here now. You've moved here? That's right. So yeah. now Dubai is going to be your home? That's correct. My new base. Tell me why. The catalyst city into the rest of the world. I think the energy here of anything is possible is contagious and very different to any other city in the world. And I love the fact that Dubai is a 2050 plan. Which city do you know that has a 2050 plan? And so I love that. I think that when I look at what they've achieved here over the last 20 or 30 mm. years, particularly the last 20 years, mm. and, and see the crazy ideas they had to do things yeah. that everybody else thought was ridiculous. Yeah. You know, we're, we're here on, a, on an island right now that's, right. that's the shape of a palm tree. That's right, exactly. Right. Back, back you said that 20 years ago. Yeah, what we're going to do, you imagine sitting down, just sitting <laughs> around the match list, and be like, right, what we're going to do is we're going to build three palm trees <laughs> right. out at sea. Right. We're going to build a bunch of islands in the shape of right. the world. Right. Then, then we're going to build the, the world's largest marina. Then exactly. Then it's like, yeah, really? exactly. You know, exactly. You know, you've got to be nuts to think about that kind of Absol stuff. I mean, that ambition is, you can feel it through the whole city and it set the tone. And that's what excites me so much about the city. And then there's the speed as well. I mean, I remember back in London years ago, um, Canary Wharf being built. Right. And Canary Wharf seemed to take forever, forever. to be <laughs> yeah. built. And yeah. I know there's a whole bunch of buildings around it, but yeah. it just seemed to be that that was, that was a tower that was taking forever. And I know Canary Wharf, I think is 55 floors. Right. Well, 55 floors here is, yeah, is yeah. what you have for breakfast. That's yeah? right. That's and right. the speed that they knock the towers up yeah. here. You know, my, my dad comes from an architectural background. Right. And so whenever he visits, you know, yeah. he, he's picking out everything, right. stuff that I take for granted. Right, of course. But I think yeah. visitors get to see that a little bit more than when we've lived here a while. Yeah, because you become used to living in a city of the future. And yeah. you speak to anybody who's lived there for an extended period of time. And then when they go back to where they come from, it's slow. Like nothing much has changed. And yeah. here it's changing all the time. So you get an opportunity to reinvent yourself and recalibrate yourself in this sort of energetic space. And yeah. so this excites me. So a published author, three best-selling books. You briefly told me a bit of your story downstairs, which I thought was quite interesting. Great. And, and, and the bit that I, from an entrepreneurial perspective, the yes. bit that, that, that resonates with me is the kind of like... Um, I was in business, didn't know what I was doing, uh, was doing well, everything went wrong. And then then that whole kind of like how I felt as a human being mm. after going through that experience. Mm. So just for mm. the benefit of everybody that's listening, mm. just, just tell us a bit of your backstory. I come from a single mom family and I was very, very adamant not to be poor because we were very financially challenged growing up. And so I really worked hard from a very young age to not be poor. And this is very key. And that's why I'm going to keep saying it. I never worked to be rich. I worked not to be poor. And I worked so very hard. And by the time I was 25, 26 years old, I had a bunch of restaurants, retail stores, vending machines, shoe distribution businesses. And by the time I got to 29, 30, it all started crumbling around me. And in my second book, I write about this because there's a very, there's a very clear difference between running away from the darkness or running towards the light. And I was running away from the darkness. And I think many entrepreneurs are running away from the darkness. They're not actually trying to build anything. They're just trying not to be something else. Mm -hmm. And so one is fueled by anx anxiousness and the other one is fueled by excitement. And I was fueled by anxiousness. And I think many people, the default button is anxiousness in this day and age. And so really the entrepreneurial journey for me was a, a realization of my emotional state of what I was actually trying to do in the world, you know? And so after I went bankrupt, I became really depressed because I'd defined myself based on my businesses, my cars and my houses. And when that got taken away from me, I had to really dive deep into my psychology and my consciousness to try and figure out what happened and why was I driving myself so hard to create 
a successful life in front of everybody, not really for myself. And so that process really got me to start understanding what most other business people go through and the sort of underlying tonality that many people go through. And when I started discovering that other people were suffering from similar things as I was, I started helping them and started helping small businesses try and figure out the psychology behind business. And I think that's really where the key is because I think a lot of people get caught up in the business and for me, it's about why you're doing that and what is the motivating factor. And when you can define that and redefine that and recalibrate that, you become incredibly powerful. When you go back into your past, did you come from, a, you said a single mum family, but did you come from a family of, of entrepreneurs, of, of strugglers, or of settlers? I say settlers because I think a lot of people <laughs> settle in life. Yes. Uh, where was, where was, where's it in the gene pool or where's it in the family tree where you got your bit from? Well, I, my family, my grandfather was very entrepreneurial. Um, but my mom was a secretary and uh, really didn't think much of her own um, potential. She now is very successful. But back then, I think, you know, if you think back in the 70s, 80s, most people were kind of like quiet, like happy with middle class. And I think middle class was successful back then, you know. That was aspirational, yeah. It was, it yeah. was. And, you know, having a micro, I remember getting our first microwave oven. I mean, it was the biggest thing that we could have imagined, you know. And so that it was, was big as well. It, yeah, was, yeah, big, it, was, it was actually big, big. yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so I think the aspirational level back then, because, and I think very key is that our access to information was very limited. And because of that, we didn't think bigger, dream bigger. And so my entrepreneurial drive came from my grandfather, but also very much from being, from struggling. You know, I, my mom became, well, got divorced at eight years old and she looked after my brother and I alone and she couldn't make month end every month. And I was the kid sitting on the end of the bed and she was crying. And so I felt this pain and I was like, I just never want to go through this again, which was a fantastic motivator, but the very worst motivator because driving yourself not to be something, mm -hmm. you'll always catch you. <laughs> that thing that you're running away from, that dragon will always catch you. And so I've had to change my psychology and it's taken me years to do that and to move towards something rather than running away from something. And it, and it took your businesses going bankrupt That's right. in that period de of depression yeah. for you to really identify that. Yeah, because I think the thing is, is that you, know, you, you deal with people on a superficial level and there's this, there's this notion of success that you keep seeing but you know the underlying tonality you don't see or don't pick up on until you start dissecting your own and when I started dissecting my own because of the bankruptcy and going through that depression and shame and mo mostly shame I was feeling shame and embarrassed that I was the successful untouchable in my own head guy and now all of a sudden I couldn't afford a coffee I had to move from my big house into my friend's second bedroom at 30 years old. And it was a shameful process. But that process really got me to my career now. And I'm so grateful for it in hindsight. How does, because a lot of people will be thinking, you know, there's many people that have probably gone through a period of either being fired or gone bankrupt, you know, relationship ends and gone through that dark place themselves mm. of feeling pretty down about themselves. Yeah. And there isn't like a set formula mm that you seem to have gone through that mm. most people don't they kind of like kind of they kind of like mosey their way out of it in the right. end don't they it's not until they've come out the other side that they realize they've come out the other side right it's not like they're down at the lowest point and they say right now today onwards <laughs> yes. okay today onwards i'm going to change everything i'm going to think yes. let me understand this let's create a strategy yes, yes. it's almost like they, they heal a bit first mm. does that make sense to mm. you so for me, I, I think most people wouldn't understand the, the mechanics that your brain's gone through right. at that time. So just dig a little bit deeper for me here and just tell me about you're depressed. You've lost your businesses. You're, you're living on your mate's, in your mate's spare bedroom. You've got no money. Okay. How, how, what's that next step? What's that process, you know, mm. in your brain of trying to understand what you need to do as opposed to the avoidance and the pursuit? It's a great question. And, and I think it, firstly, you've got to understand it's a gradual process. There's not, I don't think there's one aha moment. I think there's many, many points of anger and shame and crying that you're doing secretly yeah. and with your mom or with whoever is closest to you. And in that process, what you realize is that you've created rituals that have become habits, that have become behaviors that have put you in this place. And so what you've got to do is start by changing small rituals. And it's these small rituals of the way you think, 
of what time you wake up, of what you eat, of what you get to, whether it's a drink or a, whatever you use to try and numb the pain. It's about changing small rituals on a daily basis, moment by moment, so that you're able to move your ritual into a behavior and into a habit that now moves you out of that energetic space. And so you realize that what had happened really to have gotten you there is that your rituals, behaviors, and habits started to change somewhere. Something clicked here that you didn't realize that got you into this place. And if it's those rituals, Rituals, habits, and behaviors that did that, you can actually change them to move up. So what I started doing was every time I got into a brain space or a thought process of thinking of myself of somebody that couldn't become successful again or wasn't able to start another business or was scared of attracting a business partner that was going to help me go bankrupt again, I had to catch myself, awareness, redefine the story, and then tell myself a new story. And initially, it was very, very hard. And then eventually, your new story starts becoming your reality. And so it's really about watching your moment by moment thought processes and those will change you. So it's a gradual process. It's like saying if you're really overweight, how do you lose weight? It's a gradual process. And hopefully you can afford to a certain extent to surround yourself with the right people and expose yourself to the right information and start to fill yourself up with that information rather than anything else. So I got myself out of it through a process of gradual shift. Okay, so did you have to get um, and, and again, I'm assuming everybody does this. I'm not going to assume you did this. Did you, at the, at the time that you went into that depression, did you actually hold other people accountable at that time for the reason the businesses have gone bust? Or were, like most people do, if things go wrong, they hold other people accountable. And, and it's when they start taking responsibility for their actions that I think things start to change. Did you go through that? Absolutely. I was so livid and d- disgusted with those people that had... Um, sort of planned my demise. And, and it was, there was one guy specifically that was very instrumental in the process. And, you know, I've got daddy issues and he's got daddy issues and all everybody around him's got daddy issues. And what happens when you have daddy issues, you are desperate for acknowledgement. So you give up so much of your energy and space in lieu of some acknowledgement from somebody to say, well done, boy. And this guy that I looked up to was the guy who actually helped me sink. And so I went from hero worshiping this guy to hating him. And you know what was the funniest thing is when I moved to Cape Town after this had happened, I bumped into him everywhere I went. Really? Everywhere. At the grocery store, on the promenade, at the gym, everywhere I went. This, it was almost like the shadow moving around with me, you know? And I realized that I needed to shift my perspective and hatred of this person for him to disappear out of my context you know and now i never see him anymore you know i had to heal him and tony robbins i know who's been on your show he has this concept of moving from unconscious memories to conscious memories from blaming your past to thanking your past and i now call him a dark angel because i think that we often think of angelic angels being of people who help us in the most with harps, you know, and and beautiful ways. But actually the people that cause us the most pain are fantastic teachers. And I call them a dark angel. And I think we all have dark angels in our lives. And I almost think we are dark angels for some people as well. You know, you play that sort of role. And now I see him empathetically because now I understand why he needed to be so malicious in his greed. And it's because he lacks. And so he needed to find as many victims around him that he attracted to himself because of our own victim mindset and lack of acknowledgement. So yes, of course, initially very angry, but now very free of those sort of um, blaming the world or shaming the world around me. So how does then uh, a restauranter, bar owner, entrepreneur, shoe wholesaler, <laughs> then go from that whole experience to a completely different direction mm. in your life moving mm. forward. Mm. Um, uh, how, how, how does, uh, did you have an interest in singularity? Was, yes. it, was, was there was just, you know, before you just thought, that's an interesting subject, I wanna learn more mm. about it. Is that where it started for you? I was an early adopter from day dot. Okay. If I can think back right to the beginning of my life, really, I was born in Swaziland. And you must imagine Swaziland's a little village and really nothing much happens there. But I remember very distinctly seeing, seeing a pair of Nikes for the very first time. And this was, I mean, I'd never Nike seen- running shoes. Yeah. yeah okay. and, and we're talking back in the, I don't know, maybe 80s, very early 80s. Mm. And I, for some reason, was fixated with these shoes. I had no idea why I was fixated with them. And I 
actually lied to my mom that I was playing a fictitious tennis match so she could buy them for me, you know, because she, she, shame, she couldn't afford them, but I had to create a story. And I, I got a couple of slippers thrown my, to my head uh, after she found out, which uh, I obviously deserved. But right from a very young age, I, I picked up on Nike. And this was before Michael Jordan. I mean, I'd never seen an advertising for it. And that moved into very much, I got the rights for G-Star for South Africa before anybody knew what G-Star was. I got the, the restaurant brand that I started buying into was a brand that nobody knew about before. I got into it, acupuncture footwear, which I got from London, nobody had really, so I've got this knack to connect sort of, I don't know, invisible dots to mm -hmm. certain products and certain ranges. So I've always been interested in the future. I never knew that it would become a career for me, you know, and I think that's the whole concept of following your passion because it's so easy for me. I, I can categorize and contextualize the future for any industry quite easily and put it together in a way, in a framework that execs become more courageous in decisions that they need to make for the future. And so it's always been with me and I'm, and I'm so grateful to have looped around into it and made it my career now. So how does someone go from that place mm. to them making this their career? That's, right. that's, that, that's a yeah, kind sure. of bold movement, isn't it? Sure, yeah, absolutely. And I think the first- Any, Anyone would forgive you for kind of like falling back into the sure. uh, same yeah. world or, yeah. or you know, entrepreneurial, but in, yeah. in the same categories. Well, you know, I did try to get back into the entrepreneurial world and it just didn't click. It just wouldn't click, you know. I, I tried two or three things and my mom said to me actually in a conversation, she says, why are you going back to do retail and rent restaurants? You hated them. I said, but mom will be quick money which is the worst answer in the world, you know? And thank goodness for whatever energies and universe there is, it just wouldn't click no matter what I did. And so what I decided to do was help small businesses not repeat my behavior by understanding trends differently. And I developed a system or a framework that I call Trenovate using trends to innovate. And this became a 45 minute whiteboard session that I used to draw out for clients. And mm -hmm. smaller businesses really had an uptake of turnover. And I remember the first business I helped was a health cafe. And I started looking at the trends on health cafe. And back then there were no superfoods in any of their menus. And now, I mean, we've got so many superfoods I can plot. It's obvious, everybody's yeah, got superfoods. Everything. Everything's, super, everything's a superfood now, you know? So. Um, back then it wasn't. So we changed their menu, added superfoods because of the trends that I'd watched and they went up 20% in turnover because they were the first to have done it in Cape Town. And slowly but surely what started to happen is people were more interested in my methodology than they were in me actually helping their business. So they kept saying to them, friends, like, come and do that methodology again for my business or come and do that methodology for me and my friends. We'll put some people together. We want to see how you dissect and contextualize the future. And so I started doing this more and more and that became a keynote. And so I started then, they asked me to do a talk on it. And so I started writing a keynote on it and I did the keynote and that was really successful because people hadn't, I, you know, I finally thought that everybody saw the future like that. It was so obvious. I imagine you as well, like, can't you see that? I mean, it's so yeah. obvious certain things to you. And this was just obvious to me. And that keynote became a book and the book became a bestseller and bada bing, bada bang. Now I'm doing it all around the world and helping governments understand the future. And so you're three books in. Three books in. All best-selling books. Yes. And is, is that because you like writing books or you feel that it's important to put your ideas and concepts down on paper? Two, two, different, two different things. Yogi Bhajan, who brought Kundalini Yoga from the East to the West, he has a saying, he says, if you want to understand something, read about it. Um, and if you want to dive deeper into it, write about it. But if you want to master something, teach it. And you know, you become, not that I'm a master by no means, but you become really good at it. You become an expert at it or a specialist at it and whatever you're having to teach. And so you have to take on so much information and then assimilate it and digest it and then bring it out. And when you bring it out, you're birthing something. And in that birthing process, now you've created new synapses in your brain. And, and, and the process of storytelling is deeply entrenched in my lineage. You know, my grandfather used to have many, many people come over to our homes, uh, to our home, and he used to tell them poetry and poetry about their problems in life. So oh, they would really? say, you know, I have a marriage problem or a money problem, whatever it was, and then you would say a poem. And in that poem, he would dissect the poem and explain to them what they need to do. And so I've kind of got the storytelling lineage in my life. And um, the process of writing books gives me an opportunity to take on more information. You've written a book, and I'm sure you know that when you decided to write that book, every piece of information you came across was a potential piece for the book, mm -hmm. no matter what it was. Mm -hmm. And so you take on information differently. So yeah. it's actually the most selfish process because everything becomes about this book. And my next book called The Evolution of Value is very much like everything I'm looking at now. I'm like, okay, that can fit in here, this can fit in here. And so it really becomes a, a thesis of sorts that you go through, you know, and uh, I absolutely love it. I'm addicted to writing them now. I think almost like my life feels 
one dimensional if I don't have another project that's that's bubbling under. So looking for the as an early adopter, okay, give us give us some things and some some aspects to life and business at the moment that you're seeing and you're looking into maybe for others for your own sure. research that uh, that can give us a, a, our audience a wider sure. understanding. You see, the problem is, is, well, the challenge is that we find ourselves in a transition phase between two very different types of society at the moment. Um, one is the industrial revolution and the other is the quantum world that we're moving into. And the very understanding of science is changing. You know, we've gone from sort of this uh, Newtonian science concept to quantum science, which is a very different concept. We're moving in society in the most incredible way where the society we come from had very little freedom, but absolute certainty of belonging to your tribe or to your little village. And today we have absolutely no certainty, but so much freedom. And so now we find ourselves in this transition phase and people are anxious about it because what they're trying to do is recreate yesterday into tomorrow, into a brand new world that doesn't work. And so the concept that most businesses are trying to grapple with is what do we do? And my understanding is not so much what you should do is how you should behave. Because the world we're moving into is not linear, it's multifaceted, multidimensional. And the fact that we have to be recreating and reinventing ourselves, our organizations and people around us on a continuous basis is really the magic for you to understand. Because when you understand that behavior and adaptability becomes your superpower in the future, you then become very powerful. And the way that I've written about it in Foresight is how do you become naturally adaptable and naturally flexible and naturally optimistic about the future? And there's two characteristics that I've kind of understood from my own growth and as well as from interviewing other people. And the first one is wisdom. And what wisdom is, it's quite a broad term, but mm. what wisdom is, is Alan Watts said it best. He says, the knowledgeable man learns something new every day. The wise man unlearns something new every day. And it's about unlearning and healing our pasts and mm -hmm. really getting rid of anything that's kept us resentful or in a loop or in a, in a pattern holding process. It's about healing those. And both in a personal level as well as a organizational level. Your history, your past, your past successes are almost irrelevant because of how different the world is moving into the is future. That almost like, is that almost like, like having having to unlearn the bad habits you've got. Yes, so oh, you can, you can learn absolutely. Habits, yeah. And those bad habits are so deeply entrenched into our psyche that we, we, we don't really know how to even access them if you haven't asked the question. And now science is proving that 50% of our memories are actually subjective stories we've made up for ourselves that we've kept our identity strong with, you know? And but so- said, What's that, that thing someone has said to me about, if you read a book, let's say you read a book on, on a, a, a real scenario that happened, yes. okay, true, true, true crime, let's right. take that. Um, and you read that book and you understand what happened. It becomes, it becomes the truth. But the yeah. best thing to do is actually to take that book and read lots of books around that yes. subject as well. Yes. And, and, and that will give you a much better understanding of what's really going on. So this is yeah. rather, rather than it being our own reality. There's lots of things that we'll talk about with our parents and we'll say, they'll say, do you remember when that happened? Yeah. Or do yeah. you remember when you did yeah. that? And yeah. you'll be like, no. What do you mean? Yeah. Or do you, no, that's not what happened, Mum. Exactly. This, this, this is what exactly. Happened. And this is, oh, that definitely. So is. you know, if if five of us go out for dinner, each of us will have a different memory of that evening, and whose memory is right? Yeah. And what you do is you attach different things to different what he said and she said, and that's what she meant. And now you hold on to that story. You know, being an early adopter does does artificial intelligence excite you? Yes. And when you when you look into the application of AI in pretty much everything that mm. I've I've read into so far, it it literally has me extremely excited Absolutely. about what can happen. Yes. Um, and one thing that I thought was really interesting I was learning about the other day was about philanthropy. Right. And so I, I, the problem with philanthropy is if Bill and Melinda Gates with their gazillions and bazillions <laughs> and, you know, in their foundation that yeah. they want to contribute towards worthy causes, yeah. there's always gonna be bias. Of course. Because it's what matters to Bill or yes. Warren or, or Melinda, yes. okay, with, with that money. That's yes. the things that matter to them, them them the most. Sure. But by using artificial intelligence to understand mm. really, okay, mm. all all of if you to take all of the needy causes around right, the world. Right. Okay. And then AI to decide to take that there's a billion right. dollars to decide what makes the most sense. Right, right. Would be far less bias focused. Sure. Sure. And I hadn't thought about bias yeah, until yeah. I started to understand sure. AI and, to, and, and recruitment's another one. A friend of mine's got a recruitment business. Right. And the, the problem we have is when we recruit people, 
then what subconsciously we do, if we like them at the beginning of the meeting, then we'll look subconsciously for other for, things. Yes, like of them, course, yeah? of course. And, and again, vice versa, if yes, we dislike them. Yes. But with AI, it doesn't allow for that to happen. Right. So by by definition, as, as a human being, mm. you're always going to be a bad recruiter. <laughs> yes, that's true. Because <laughs> you're always yes. going to have some form of bias. bias of course. And yeah. that's, we, we know that there's so much nonverbal communication that of takes course. place in a meeting of two yes. people. Yeah. So when, you, when I think about that, I think, I think what comes to my mind is, in those two, exa two examples is fair. Mm, okay. Objective, yeah, fair, and, yes, and, clean. And, and, yeah, and yeah. we like the word fair. Yes, absolutely. Okay? And, and yeah. everyone can identify with the word right, fair. Right. And even if you lose, but you lose fairly, right. it's, okay, that's fair. Yes, you know? yes, exactly. Like you with the guy that, you, that helped destroy your businesses, you know, yes. we, we, that wasn't fair. No. Okay. But mm. if we're with, the, with AI, to me, that's an exciting thing to consider. Yeah, I think a lot of people get caught up in Elon Musk's first sort of ideas around Elon, uh, around AI. And, you know, he's changed his tone. I mean, now he says, I'd rather be a pessimist, uh, I'd rather be an optimist and wrong than a pessimist and right about AI, right? And I think AI is going to help us in incredible ways. And we must all think about AI like electricity. Because 100 years ago, if you wanted to improve something, you added electricity to it. Now we electricity is everywhere. And soon AI will be attached to everywhere. You know, and so I think obviously it has its pitfalls like everything does. And we need to focus, for me, it's about focusing on the positives and focusing on what it can do to upgrade humanity and shift our ability to be more intelligent and to be man and machine to create much more abundance for everybody. But people at always, after my keynotes, they always have that negative attachment to it because they've bought into the sort of Hollywood stories around yeah. it. And Well, it's the truck drivers losing their jobs to artificial vehicles sure. that are going to be doing trust work. Sure. So to me, that's not a problem. Retrain and go do something else. Absolutely. There's going to be a million new jobs created anyway. Or the Luddites from your country Luddites, that were very yeah. unhappy with all the tractors yeah. and factories arriving and then yeah. breaking the windows of the factories. I mean, retrain and reskill, but you know what that is? You're caught up in your memories. Mm -hmm. You haven't, yeah. you know, Joe Dispenza talks about, um, are you living a life based on a set of memories from your past? Or are you living a life based on the vision of your future? And I made a, a vlog the other day and I said, you know, most of us plan our holidays better than we plan our lives. If you know where you're going on holiday in two weeks' time, you'll know what passport, what visa, what maybe you had to train differently, going to the beach, you clothes, da, da, da. Okay, so tell me about your future in the next five years. Mm, how much money do you want to make? Mm, what sort of lifestyle do you want to live? Oh, I haven't thought about it. Dude, <laughs> where are you going if you can't design it? And Robin Sharma has a great saying. He says, um, clarity before mastery. And so the thing you want to do is you want to, Heal your past because you don't realize how much it determines your future. You know, for me, that's imperative. And that's been a big part of my sort of growth. But then let's be honest, the vast majority of the population of most, no, every country yes. in the world yes. is at that place. Yeah, but that's the transition phase we're in. We're waking up to these sort uh, of scenarios. Are we going through transition? I know you talked about 1989 and what happened there with the Berlin Wall that's right. and what happened with you know in China, Chinaman and Square, um, and and that for me World was Wide really Web. interesting to understand mm. people at the age of 40. Yes, you know they're going from the what was we, it from me to me we. to we. Yeah, that's right. And I thought that was really you know yes. because I, I I'm from that era. I was right. 19 years old in 1989, oh, wow, so wow, that, wow. I was at the height of my kind of awareness of right. all these types of things. Right, and so. It, it, it really kind of resonated with me as you talked about it. Yeah. But I, I wonder really if people, if we're going through a transition, do people realize there's a transition? And if they don't realize a transition, how they then can transition? Well, I think with social media and what's going on out there, you can't get away from it. You know, nonfiction books is now starting to outsell fiction books. In fact, more nonfiction titles are coming out than fiction titles. There's more meditation apps for you to download on your phone than ever before. There's more yoga retreats for you to go on. There's more, there's just more of it, you know? And so there's never been so many self-help gurus in the world. You know, they become superstars all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And so it's in our culture. And it's coming in, in from every direction. I mean, the most watched movie in the history of movies was Avatar. About what? About love, unity, and collaboration over greed and ego. So you understand that it is moving into our reality. And you can look at something like veganomics that's growing around the world on the awareness 
of animal abuse. And, you know, we went through the same thing when we realized that slavery was wrong. And we went through the same thing when we realized that women had as much brains as men. And we came, went through the same thing when we realized that child labor wasn't that great. And so now when we look back on all of those, it was a level of consciousness that we came out of and an awakening that happened to us. And so we are just fast tracking this awakening right now, you know, and, and I think the proliferation of information, again, is at the heart of us starting to wake up, you know, and having this sort of access to information. Remember, 15 years ago, you had no access to information. Where was your information coming from? BBC? Mm. CNN? I mean, that was it. And today, it's a plethora of information that you can tap into, you know. And by 2029, they reckon all the information will be linked by a wire into our brain and we'll have digital neocortexes inter in linked to the internet. And it's already started with Neuro Neuralink with um, Elon Musk creating that. So I think this is all going to be uplifting humanity. We've never had a bigger middle class. We've never had more women educated. And so I'm a very big optimist around where we're going. When we think about that, and just for everyone that's listening, I'm sure they're going to have questions and, again, fearful issues as well. Sure. We have a mobile phone. Yes. It has, you know, computing power beyond what we ever imagined that yes. went up to the moon, moon and yeah, all yeah. that kind of stuff. There's old news there. Um, everything is in the palm of our hand. Yes. Let's talk about education. Yes. Kids go to school. Yes. You know, when I went to school, I don't know how old you are, but I'm 49 years old. Yes. All right. When I went to school, um, you, you had to memorize everything. Yes. And you had to study really hard. If yes. you didn't study really hard, and if you didn't cram before the exams, yes. then you're in trouble, yeah? Because yes. it was going to represent badly in the grade you got, <laughs> yes, yeah? Yes. And so some of us, you know, I've got two daughters. My youngest daughter doesn't have to doesn't have to do any revision. Okay, she just... She's just, she's got right. it. Whereas my eldest, mm. she really has to battle. Right. And so, but she knows she has to battle. Yes. So she puts the hours in. Yes. When we look at, when we look at what Gary Vaynerchuk's talking about now, it's like if he was, if he was in charge of the schooling mm. system mm. in the United States, mm. he would ban anyone okay, at school from having to memorize. Yes, of course, anything, of course. Which I, I find fascinating. Yes, of course. But also what he'd do is he'd teach something on day one of the week and mm. he'd make everybody go and do it for the next four days. Right, okay. <laughs> and uh, and again, for me, when I learn stuff, mm. learning is mm. about doing as mm -hmm. opposed to about sitting mm -hmm. there, there were books. Mm -hmm. When we think about the future of young people, mm. okay, the 12 year olds onwards up to the mm. age of 16, 17 at high school mm. and how they're gonna learn and, and how, um, the future is going to make it better for them from an educational point of sure. view. What views do you have on that? What thoughts do you have around Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, think about the transition <coughs> phase we're in right now. You are using a high-tech app called Uber to get your child to go to a 19th century factory looking like school <laughs> to study something from last century. And so we're in that transition phase, right? Well, I think the biggest sin of education has been always about teaching us what to think, not how to think. And I think the future of education is about the malleability of how you think, how you adopt, how you reshift your learnings of different things through very practical terms. We understand that just reading something isn't really what it's about, it's about practicing. And if you see what's happening in Finland and how they've changed the oh, education yeah, system, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I saw that, yeah. And I think that's the future of it. You know, One of the examples that we're talking about is putting kids into a farm. And then in that farm, you run the farm and in the running of the farm, you do maths, you do English, you do geometry, you do all those subjects, but in very practical terms. And now you've learned how to run a farm plus all the subjects, not the subjects to fit into a farm, but actually a farm to fit the subjects into. Yeah, yeah. So it's the practical way of going about practicing those sorts of topics. But I think also what's always happened to us in education is that we were never allowed to practice curiosity. And curiosity was drummed out of us. I mean, if you went to school and you said to your teacher, I love art, she would say, that's very sweet, darling. You can do that after school. We're all going to sit here and do algebra together. And really, truth be told, I'm not good at algebra. So I was useless at school. I, was, I got expelled from school a few times because I hated that doctrine that was going on around me. And I truly believe that school's excellent for 25% of the human population. Because if you've got a STEM mindset, you're winning. And everybody else, entrepreneurship wasn't gifted at school, sports wasn't gifted at school, any of these other things, what art wasn't. But if you knew science, uh, English, uh, engineering, and those sort of things, you were really gifted. So I think what's starting to happen is that we need to allow our children to follow their curiosity. And in that curiosity, what you give them the opportunity to do is a never ending stream of energy to research that curiosity. And what happens when you research it constantly? You become a specialist and an expert at it. Then you add your personality to it and now you have a unique signature 
that you can bring to the world. And in that unique signature, there's no competition because nobody's like you. And in that unique signature, you become naturally collaborative, naturally adaptive. And now you have something called the internet that's got 4 billion people on it. And you can just get 0.01% of the people to buy your product and service and you're doing well forever. And so really the world of work and the structures and the hierarchies are shifting because we don't have to fit in to those sort of BCom, MBA, CA, these sort of concepts and constructs are starting to fall away because they become commoditized. You're a really good lawyer, guess what? There's another billion of you out there. You're a really good accountant, guess what? There's another machine that can do your job. But the future of work and education for me is about the unique signature based on your personality and your curiosity that's combined that can create any business you want to create, you know? I had a guy at one of my keynotes said to me, what if you like life-saving? I mean, what if that's your passion? I said, even with life-saving, you could have a YouTube channel, you could sell board shorts, umbrella, you could, everything to do around life-saving, you could be a thought leader in that, you could help save the oceans, you could, I mean, go, and go, keep going. I mean, how many more options are there, you know? So I think many people are scared of their own genius, they're scared of their own curiosity because we haven't allowed to practice it, and often I get a response, but you can't make money from your passion. And I'm like, dude, that is the only way you can make money, that's the only thing that really, attracts people to you because you know you want to be around excited people and so is somebody who's highly accomplished excited no somebody who's highly on mission or on purpose are they excited constantly and so who do you want to be around excited people mm. not people who are accomplished and the 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 the, the 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 issue with with education and the world we come from people thought if you accomplished you'd become successful but how many people do you know that are accomplished with all the boxes ticked that are miserable mm. that are alcoholics that nice. are taking pharmacy most, because they logically made decisions about the future, not through curiosity, they made it through ego and logic. And so what we're finding ourselves today in this world of education is we've got to get our kids to ask better questions, have more grit, because there is an issue with millennials and Generation Z wanting things too quickly, and thirdly, to follow your passion and allow them to do that, you know? And ultimately, parents must become very clear that your actions are louder than any words that you're saying. And if you want your kids to be adaptable, optimistic, flexible, and collaborative, you become that. And when you become that, they f- copy you. Hmm. Epic, epic. You wrote three books. Tell us about each book quickly before we finish. Sure, What's Your Moonshot was my first book, was um, this one here. Yeah. And really, What's Your Moonshot is about um, how big, how courageous, and how bold are your questions about the future? If you understand that the internet gives you access to 4 billion people, what are you doing about it? And why are you worried about your little career still? And so think bigger. But the problem is, if you're not thinking bigger, you're suffering from victimhood. And so I break down victim traits and how to switch them into victor traits or architect traits and architect and designing your future. And then I categorize and contextualize the future to give you courage and clarity to make better decisions. The second book uh, is called Magnetize, and it's about stop the chase, understand the future, and really start to realize, are you anxious or are you excited about reality? And if you are anxious, it's because you haven't dealt with your psychology. And I had many issues around shadow psychology. And if you know, Jung talks about our shadows that really rule our lives. And shadows are parts of our personality we haven't owned. It's what society, religion, and our parents told us we shouldn't do. Like, don't be greedy, don't be horny, don't be any of these bad things. And then so what happens, we put those personalities to create into our shadow. And these shadows drive greed, drive acknowledgement, drive all these things. And that's why we have so many leaders around the world that are greedy in, in what they do because they never got acknowledgement from their parents and they put all those stuff into their shadows. So I talk about why I got divorced. And again, I categorize and contextualize the future so people can get deeper into their psychology and understand the future differently. Okay. <laughs> And then I wrote Foresight, and Foresight is about the two characteristics we need to develop in order to become adaptable for the future, and in order to be able to connect the invisible dots that nobody else can see. And you can only see certain invisible dots, and I can only see certain invisible dots, and the only way we can see and connect those invisible dots is when you become wiser and more curious. And curiosity is your signature, wisdom is getting rid of your past issues, and when you combine those two, you get foresight. You stop suffering from hindsight, plain sight, insight, and develop foresight, which is this characteristic that's needed for the future. Fantastic. The types of people that you do business with, the companies that you work with, 
Tell me a bit about those. Okay, what type of, you're, you've moved here to Dubai, so obviously, you, you, you know, you're not here for your health. Well, you probably <laughs> are here for your health, but, mm. but uh, when you think about the kind of companies that you work for, what type of businesses reach out and talk to you? Every single business. I can tell you, I mean, um, from retail to banking to oil to fashion to a- every business, because every business is going through the exact same thing. They li- they're suffering from legacy thinking. They've got leaders that are excellent at business from yesterday, and there are very few people skilled enough to understand what's happening tomorrow. Most excos, most executive boards or, or board members, and if you ask the skill set sitting around the table making decisions about the business over the next five years, not one person with blockchain mentality, not one person with AI, not one person with data scientists sitting around the table. It's like having a board, an exec team in 1998 that doesn't understand the internet. It's exactly the same thing that's happening right now. Hmm. And people of power are holding on and gripping with what they knew yesterday. And it's becoming irrelevant. Fantastic. And how do people get hold of you, John? Uh, the internet. Uh, John Sane. I'm so happy that there is not one other John Sane in the world. Is what a not, win. What a win. I mean, so <laughs> so John Sane, I'm, I'm on all the channels. I share constantly because the more I share, the more space I make for more info. And so I'm constantly making vlogs, blogs, schmogs, writing books, doing talks. So yeah, please follow me. What's Great your favorite you. medium to work with? You, obviously, you've written three books. but Video. You, video is your favorite medium. I'm very comfortable speaking in front of crowds. I actually do my best thinking while I'm speaking. I sometimes surprise myself by what I say. I'm like, whoa, that was pretty smart. I mean, actually, I don't know where that came from. And so I'm a, I'm a thinker while I'm speaking. And so all my books are dictated to my ghostwriter. I'm constantly sending him uh, WhatsApp voice notes and all sorts of different sort of concepts through voice. And so video for me is by far my uh, favorite medium to share my thoughts. And in terms of you consuming content, what do you consume? Sure. I mean, I, I, I wish no, I could I main know. way. Uh, yeah. Ma- yeah. What, how, what, what, what medium do you use to consume? Do you prefer Podcast, to watch- YouTube. Um, and I, I read some. It, I find reading slow. The amount of information I can get into my head while reading, I, I find it slow. And with podcasts, I even like Audible. I canceled my Audible subscription because I find it slow. It's like I want to get a podcast because what I can do with a podcast, I can understand the author or the thought leader's principal points. I think I'm like you. I'm a generalist. I like to know a lot about a lot. I don't want to dive too deep into one topic. And uh, so for me, podcasts are, are the quickest way or, or an interview on YouTube is the quickest way for me to, to gain um, information. And do you think that's the same for most people nowadays? No. I think, I think that you get personality traits that like to dive deeper. And you have- but in terms of the consumption of content is what I'm trying to th- think about here. Because for me, mm. um, I, the fastest way to consume content is that way. Mm. All right. Now, if I'm in the car driving and a podcast, That's right. I can get that done. Yeah. Um, I, I think less and less people are actually reading. Yes, I agree. You know, I think more and more people are buying books, but less and less people are reading. You know that? Book sales are through the roof yeah and so it's almost like and even me i'll buy a book and i like it and i start reading parts of it then i watch an interview then i watch a podcast and i got the gist of the book mm-hmm. you know and so i almost buy the book to support the author because i like people who are putting effort into it especially now that i'm doing it you know and you remember back in the day when you used to like uh, get onto a, one of those dodgy websites and download a movie and if you told anybody in the movie industry they'd be so angry with you but you never understood it until you were in a movie yeah. and then you were like hang on a second why am i doing that so i actually buy books just to support the author because i love the fact that they put so much effort into it and it's nice to have as a reference point because that's what i'm doing is researching but i think you have some people that dive deep into the information and some people like you and i that just want to get as much information into my into our heads but i think we're also suffering from something else now the burden of choice with like you almost panic that you want to get so much in so you how many times you hear about an author and you write the list and then you've got a list it gets yeah. longer and longer and longer you just can never yeah. get into it you know 100 so there's just so much information out there so um it's just about just trying what, to pick up. what's his name um amazon um jeff Be- uh, jeff bezos, jeff bezos. Jeff, but they said to him why books at the beginning yeah. he said because there are more categories in books than there are in anything else yeah. <laughs> he wow, said yes. so selling books having so many categories mm. and so many different ways I, i've got 
bags of options yeah. from day one. Yeah. And obviously I thought, I thought that, you know, that's obvious. That's great. A, yeah. a lot of us don't realise why yeah. it started with books. Yeah, I mean, that's right. My kids wouldn't even know it was books in the movie. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we did when it started. Mm. John, thank you so much for coming on the show. No, my absolute I pleasure. thoroughly enjoyed listening to you speak. Thank you, Spencer. Really, really valuable. And, thank uh, you. Uh, I hope once you've settled here in Dubai and you've got yourself uh, kind of settled in and spent some time here, yes. that you can come and share some more stories. With I us. would love that. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Thanks. Okay, cheers. Well, there you have it, the Spencer Lodge podcast and the awesome guest, John Sane, here with us today. And if you didn't learn something in the last 45 minutes from what John said, then you must have been asleep. How <laughs> epic was it to learn about not only a guy that's been a successful entrepreneur that lost everything and had to start all over again, but also t- decided on a completely different direction to take in terms of business and his future and found really a mission of service more than anything else, a service to find your why. It was so interesting for me to pick up on different parts and not only watch this podcast, I'm going to tell you stuff I don't usually tell you on my podcast. Go and look at what John does on YouTube. Go and listen to his TED Talk. Go and see some of the other events that he speaks at because he's got some really important information for all of us that might be a little bit fearful of the past and hanging, uh, sorry, fearful of the future, sorry, and hanging on to the past. Check it out.